Right. Uh, hello, everyone. So I am Sujit, and I work with NASA Impact as a lead AI researcher. So today we will be covering the some glimpse of how we can potentially go towards digital twin and what does how does the foundation model uh, look like when we are designing and what we have designed so far. So fundamentally, we will be covering actually two foundation models. Both have been designed by NASA Impact and IBM in collaboration, uh, along with a couple of other folks, uh, industries. So we have Prithvi, which is GFM, and also the Prithvi, uh, which is weather and climate. Prithvi, the people who you don't know. So this is a word, a word that came from, comes from Sanskrit, and it, it represents, it means earth. So what does the foundation model actually mean, right? So foundation model are a type of generative AI. So you try to give mask or something and you try to generate something. Like I want to have a cup of tea and you can just, you know, mask out the cup and then the model predict what you want to do. Right. So generally you have seen uh, that in the, you know, learning applications as well as language and translation capabilities. Now you can do that in the codes as well, like co-pilots and also like human interaction, speech processing. So they have different outputs um, based on the different input or prompts. Everybody is very familiar with chat GPT. I don't think, uh, you know, I need to emphasize on what they can do, but you can look at some of the foundation models like BERT, GPT, Clare, uh, Prithvi, WXFM, Stable Diffusion. So there are different approaches and, uh, you know, foundation model out there on the different uh, mechanisms, which you like one is based on transformers, then you have the architecture based on diffusion models, which we might just go a, a bit deep into that, not very deep into that. So this first, the first part we'll be covering is the Prithvi, which is the foundation model for the generalist geospatial artificial intelligence. So to design this, we firstly use the data set, which is from the HLS. So HLS is the NASA data set, which is, uh, you know, uh, in the MGRS style system, they are available in the tiles. You have Landsat and Sentinel 30 meter resolution data. Then each tile has a, you know, 3,660 pixels cross 3,660 pixels, which uh, correspond to approximately 110 kilometers range, right? And then you have one GeoTIFF file per spectral band. And why, uh, you know, HLS? Because you have the rotation across the, uh, you know, the covering of the Earth is approximately two to four days. So you you get a lot of uh, data coverage in a less period of time. So when you train all of these models, the one fundamental question is, do you train on all of the data that is available or do you select on the data? Fundamentally, there is no primary correct answers, but what approach generally you one takes uh, during designing these models is how do we sample the data? So let me tell you the caveat of taking all the data. So what would happen if I have taken all of the HLS data? Firstly, my computation time would grow, definitely. The second thing is the data, you know, storage and cost would be huge because we have petabytes of data in HLS. And the third primarily, that when you're capturing these all information of the Earth through the satellite imagery, you're capturing a lot of information that is not changing compared to the information that is changing. So there is a chance of having a huge bias in the data, which is like the model is able to see a lot of repetition in the data sets. So for this, we firstly utilize the data sampling procedure, which was we take the data by aggregating the different statistics, for example, temperature and precipitation. We divide them into different region and groups based on the statistics. And then we sample the data of the HLS equally from each of the groups. So by this method, you are reducing the bias, potential bias that might be coming in the data because of the repetition. So this is what the foundation model primary look like uh, for the Prithvi version that we had. So this is based out of the MAE architecture, which is mask auto encoder, but with the 3D computer, you know, 3D convolutions. So you have HLS data here with the six bands, which is red, green, blue, and IR, sphere one and sphere two. So you have fundamentally six bands. They are into the shape of 224 by 224. And then what you do is you mask out 75% of the image. So what it looks like is something this. So you are, you give the model something by masking 75% and you feed it to the encoder and then decoder has one job to predict the masks. And then you calculate the L1 loss and then model learns over this. So this is the architecture. This part, the first part is look what you are looking at is somewhere a foundation model pre-training architecture. 
So what you are here actually doing is you are masking out the regions and then asking the model to predict those masked regions so that model can learn the relationship between different masks, which is through the attention mechanism and across the different spatial uh, context as well. For this model, we use three input time steps with a T0, T1, T2, you know, consecutively. So you will have over a week period to take the all three samples. Uh, by reducing, obviously, you perform the pre-processing as cloud removal and other stuff, and you select this data. Now, how does it help? Is when you pre-train in this fashion, where your objective is one, which is to generate the mask. So fundamentally, you don't require labels, right? Labels are expensive. I'm like, I consider human time to be expensive, so creating the labels are expensive. So how does it help? Is you are you training a large model on the data set? which has, it's a self-supervised learning approach. So you're just masking out and you have the labels, which is the creation of the, you know, masked area. You compute the loss with the real um, uh, imagery that was captured through satellite and the model learns the relationship with that. How will it go further for different downstream use cases or application of this foundation model? I'll, you have encoder decoder architecture, yeah? So you can do it in multiple fashion. There are different ways of fine tuning. One, you can take up the encoder which has learned these patterns. And then you attach a decoder with a segmentation head and you can use it for pixel wise classification like flood and other stuff. And you can compare that with the state of the art architecture as well. You can also use the encoder and decoder and perform a fine tuning by changing the weights of the old model, right? So you will be, but you will be providing some label sample over these things. So you will not be providing a lot of label sample, but some label samples. And I'll show you what effect does it have when you pre-train on such large data set. So what does fundamentally mean that you have one trained geospatial foundation model that can, once I take the encoder from this one, I can adapt it to multiple tasks, which can be binary segmentation, where we used it for detecting burn scar, detecting floods. Then you have the multi-class semantic segmentation, where you're for classifying crop species, and also the data imputation, which is in a cloud gap filling. <clears throat> So this is one of the first downstream that we tested out, which was, uh, you know, with the Prithvi first model that we released, which was Sen1 floods 11 data set. So the, here, the satellite data was Sentinel-2, which is 10 meter resolution. The sample size that you have, you're looking here, is 4 into 46. The training was 252, validation was 92, 91, and test was 91. And they were all of the size of 512 by 512 chips. So the model was fed into it was fed into the model with those samples, and the model started fine tuning over those. And then you have the you know fundamental baseline, and then IOU and F1 score that you look at it is with the Prithvi pre-trained, you are getting a best performance, which is 82.99 for IOU and 19.71 for F1, as an F1 score. Where it is not pre-trained, you're having a lesser one with all the architecture. But when you compare it to the baseline architecture, which is the state of you know, state of the art in the vision transformer domain, which is like the VIT base. So, in, so you are having an accuracy or performance where the IOU is 67, 79, and 80. So overall, you know, Prithvi, with the pre trained model, you got the best, best performance with those samples. Now, interesting part is this, that what happened when you have the Prithvi pre-trained, not pre-trained, and Prithvi frozen in Coda. So when you are providing with the number of iterations, you see as you increase the number of iteration, your model performance is going high. But when you look at here, you have 25,000 iterations, so you're achieving a similar performance of the model. When you look at the IOU and why this is so important that when I took the original data and then I reduced the data by 50%, I reduced the data further by 75% and I reduced the data further by 87.5%. So fundamentally, if you look at it, you achieve the performance by having a total sample size reduced by 87.5%. So you're primarily just using 12% of the data fundamentally. You're 12.5% of the data and you can achieve a similar performance. So you have a huge reduction in the terms of the labeled data that you require for all of these cases. So if you use, say, if you have a pre-trained model which understands these relationships, then what fundamentally helps you is based on the computation time, as well as not only computation time, but also reducing the number of labeled data samples that you need. So we also tried to look at the external assessment that was with IBM NASA Prithvi, SEG former unit, and then you had some performance with the unit, and then also not on the unseen data, which no model had never seen, which is in the Bolivia. This model was primarily seen on US CONUS region. So we have the average MOU to be highest in the case of uh, IBM. Uh, so this Prithvi that we have. Another task that we try to look at is burn scar detection. And then what we are looking at here is the HLS 30 meter resolution data. The data set is available uh, on the uh, on the hugging face. And it contains this uh, single time step of HLS images uh, 
And then what you have is a sample size of 805, and again in the 512 by 512. So what you do is you take the same data structure that we discussed before, as in pre-training, you have six pounds RGB and IR, square one and square two. And then you present it to the encoder of the mo model. You have the conversion head. You update this with the dice loss. Uh, with the ground truth. The reason to using a different loss here, because if you look at the background and foreground cross, there is a huge uh, difference between the number of pixels that belongs to the non-burnt compared to the burnt areas. So you try to balance the class here. So if they would be equal, your class priority will be somewhere around 50%, right? So you will be looking at 0.5, 0.5. But when you're looking at them uh, in the in the terms of the uh, huge biasness, you try to use the dice loss to provide the weighting onto the foreground class, which is the burned area compared to the background class. And these are the burn scar detection results. So here, when you use the pre pre-trained model, you have the highest performance, which is 73.62 and 84.81 uh, as an F1 score. When you compare it with unit and VIT base, you don't have, uh, you know, you perform, uh, we perform better than the baseline architectures. Now, again, very interesting ablation study that we performed is based on a similar thing that you saw in the case of flood. You have the pre pre-trained architecture, then we have pre frozen encoder and pre not pre-trained. So you achieve a, you know, with pre-trained architecture, you are achieving the highest performance, obviously. But again, when you try to reduce the data, you can reduce the data up to 75% and you achieve the similar performance in select number of epochs. So you can, so the, the fundamentally you're looking at is you have a less amount of data that is required. Now this third task was something different, which was generative in nature. So you have the cloud gap filling data set. So you have a sample size of 7,852 and you try to predict those cloud masked areas and to fill up those spaces. So here the HLS was timestamp and it was the images between one to 200 days apart. They are not consecutive in nature anymore. It's not like zero, one and two timestamp, but they are like one to 200 days apart. And they were screened to have no more than 5% of cloud coverage. Then this is a comparison with the state of the art where we are trying to look at the cycle GAN. So it's a generative architecture uh, where you try to predict, transfer, perform the uh, you know information from one image to the another image and perform the generation for the mass areas. And then we compare the PRISV with it as well. So when you look at the MAE, sorry. So mean absolute error for the CGAN compared to PRISV, it is way, way lower and then so this is the CGAN and state of the art architecture in the computer vision domain for the you know generative task. So in the in the less number of samples, Prithvi was able to outperform the gap filling. And when you look at the SSIM, which is the structural similarity score, which is important. So mean absolute error should be lower and SSIM should be higher to match the ground truth. So if it would be SSIM is equal to one, then you would be looking at a perfect identical image sort of a structural similarity image. So when you look at the CGAN training SSIM and validation SSIM, uh, which is this, and the Prithvi training and validation SSIM, which is here, so you have a higher SSIM compared to the less number of training samples as well. So you have just 1,000 training samples and you're able to get this. So which is the example of which you can look here. So from left to right, you have the model input. So you have the reconstruction with the multi-scale discriminator output and the ground truth. So for example, here, the first row actually depicts all the three columns and you're looking at the model input, reconstruction from the VIT and the ground truth, and similarly reconstruction from the Prithvi and the ground truth. So all of so if you look at the reconstruction, the model seems to learn pretty much the exact same information that was here uh, compared to the ground truth. And here what you're looking at is basically the weighting. So the discriminator output, which is the red, the pixels are not used for assessing the image is fake. And the discriminator, dis uh, you know, detecting the pixels are real or not. So here also, when you're looking at it, so uh, you have the, uh, you know, model input reconstruction and then the ground truth. So when you look at the, these cloud areas, the model fills those and this is the ground truth. So it looks very, very close to, uh, you know, to the, to the ground truth. Now, in summation, what we are looking at here is the time. What is the advantage of using a foundation model uh, like Prithvi for different tasks? So let's say we are looking at the three different tasks that we had, which is the burn scar, flood mapping, and cloud gap filling. So you reduce the time to for training or fine tuning these things to burn scar, like 35% of the total time taken for a base architecture like unit state state of the art, flood mapping, and cloud gap filling. Similarly, 27% and 34%. Then performance of uh, Prithvi compared to the baseline. Prithvi outperformed the baseline architectures. 
And then you have the data sample used where you see a huge difference in the label data sample. So Prithvi could achieve the, you know, best performance in just 135 uh, labeled samples where the base standard needed 540. Similarly, in flood mapping with just 30 samples and in cloud gap filling with just 400 samples, we were able to achieve, uh, whereas the baseline needed 6,231 uh, 6, samples. All right, so this is part with the GFM. And now we will be going towards uh, looking at the another foundation model that we have, which is the weather FM. So there are the different scales of the atmospheric processes. So you have the micro scale, meso scales, and optic scales. So the, the gray boxes denote the weather and climate zones, and the gap is for the transitional phenomena, which are too long divided to be weather, but too short to be climate. And micro scale is less than one kilometer, meso scale is 10 to 100 kilometer, and synoptic is 100 to 1,000, and global is more than 1,000, right? So the atmospheric phenomena occur at a variety of spatial and temporal scales. But the data sets or model training are mostly limited in scale. So this provides a challenge in designing a flexible model, right? So the motivation is in the last two years, we have seen major revolutions in AI. One, you have the AI forecast emulators being used in numerical weather predictions, which is a rapid emulation of the physical processes. And then foundation models for various data types. Like specifically, we have seen a lot in language, and then also in Earth observation, like Prithvi, which I presented before, and there are some other as well. Then you have the self, which which is generally trained by self-supervised pre-training, and you fill up the gap filling problems. Now, how does it relate to the weather and climate? Simulations like partial differential equations or something obvious to they occur naturally in the weather, right? And then you have the masking and gap filling also, which you look at it like data simulation problem and downscaling. They are also there in the real data set and occur naturally in weather. So the objective is to design and train a foundation model for weather that can be easily adapted to multiple use cases. So the data set we here were considering was like MERA2, ERA5, and HRR. So MERA2 and ERA5 are global data set with a different resolution. MERA2 is 50 kilometer approximately, whereas ERA5 is 25 kilometer, and HRR is three kilometer, but HRR data set is just available over the US CONUS region. And there are the different, uh, you know, variables across the different pressure levels, which are there. But if you look at the data volume, then you have MERA2 something around 11 terabytes, where the ERA5 be 145 terabytes plus, and the HRR is 6 terabytes plus. And when we look at all of these three data sets, uh, so what you're looking at is these are all specific variables, right? You have, you have these specific variables like U, which is the wind vector, temperature, pressure. But when you try to compare them with each other, we thought that, okay, can it be possible that U from the MERA is going to be exactly the same, the U from the ERA and from the HRR? Then we try to look at the probability distribution function, and when you look at it, you see that they are significantly different than each other in terms of the distribution of the data. And this is true. The reason is uh, when you look at the MERA and when you look at the ERA, both of them, are, you know, solve the different, they're the different cost function for their simulation processes. So how does the modeling has occur with the BCS system? This is not my book title, but so you have the NWP models, which started from 1958 and you've seen till now, and then you have the deep learning based model that came up, you know, in, uh, you know, from 2019. And then you have the MetNet that came by, uh, you know, Google research, MetNet2, then you have the graph weather, then ForecastNet, Pangu by Huawei, and GraphCast and Climax by Microsoft. But fundamentally, if you look at it, all of them are forecasting models, not foundation models, only except one, which is the climax. So all of them were primarily designing, uh, you know, they designed, you know, to predict and forecast longer and longer period of time, making a benchmark of 12 to 14 days, you know, which is in comparison to the current NWP models. To understand if the, to train all of these models, the fundamental question that comes to our head is when we train these models for the weather or something, can the model understand physics? or will be able to simulate and understand the different, you know, relationship between all of them by looking at the physics. To understand that and prove that, we tried with the Clipper Fourier neural operator. Now, what we did here was you have U10, V10, and SLP. So if you look at it, the U, this is the U vector of the wind, V vector of the wind, and, this, and the surface level pressure. Now, U, V, SLP, and, you know, pressure are related to each other because the change in pressure will lead to change in U and V, and change in U and V, can, you know, it's vice versa connected. But one fundamental difference if you look from the point of mathematics is these two are vectors, but this is scalar quantity. So can I combine them in a fashion where the model can learn the geometry 
where the mod data is coming from and understand and you know try to solve this from the geometrical perspective. So this is for this we you know we utilize Clifford for a neural operator where we had the two basis vector e1 and e2 and one multi vector e1 e2. So we take two input multi vector and create a dual function which is given by this. And then this is the architecture that it looks like. So you've given the input to the model. Model goes here, and then model perform a Clifford convolution layer. So you have Clifford convolution layers, and then you perform the Fourier operations. So you take up the single. So you, if you want to understand what the neural operator does fundamentally, is you're looking at a one pixel evolution in time and trying to map to, to another pixel of another evolution in time. So let's say there is a pixel x comma y, which is here, and you're looking at the evolution in time, which is for ten input time steps. Can I take this and tell the pixel to do me for x time step 10 to 10 time step 40, which is here. So you're trying for the prediction of the longer and longer time. So you try to do here is you perform an FFT, then you try to take up the modes and you do an inverse FFT, which is here. So we presented in one of, one of our paper at ICLR, which is uh, for the atmospheric uh, influence partial differential equation. So we perform this Clifford Fourier transform in each part and revert back and concatenate both. So this is what it looked like. So U500, when you try to do the prediction for the U500 prediction, this is the target and this is the difference. So the model has very less difference. So the model is able to predict perfectly, which is actually a compressed form of the Navier-Stokes equation here. We are looking at a shallow water equation sort of situation. So the model is able to do that. But when you look at the you know predictions from here, the model start exploding the error after the T60. So T60 is 60th time step from the given initial conditions, uh, you know, at T0. So you are providing one input time step to the model and you're asking the model auto regressively to solve that for the 60th time step. What do I mean by auto regressively is you take in T0, you predict T1, you take the predicted T1 as an input to the model, predict the T2 and you keep on doing so till T60. And this data was actually spaced apart by three R. So you are looking at something around in a day, you're looking at eight uh, predictions for the next couple of three, you know, six days approximately. So here we are just providing three input variables and these are just from the weather variable data, not the ideal data set that was simulated. So there is obviously the non stationarity and other influence factor that is coming into play, which we need to take care of. But from this, the key takeaways was that model is able to learn the dynamics, which is relative to geometry. The model can be used to train the model to make a resolution invariant mapping. So resolution invariant, like you can take 200 kilometer, you can perform same do the same transfer function to you know 50 kilometer uh, model as well so you have the resolution invariant mapping which is taking the uax to map it to the a of vx the model computation here grows because we need to perform fft on a vector and a spinal part which is double the computation compared to the Fourier neural operators and implementation of transformer can help in efficiently on not only mixing token but telling the information of the geometry or the dynamics uh, you know uh, manifold the data is coming from Another part comes the model versus physics. So what you are looking here is the 10 day period and the dashed line and the means of the mean sea level pressure and trying to see a very fundamental change, which is the fundamental equations like, is the model able to conserve, you know, uh, the conservation of mass, which is a fundamental equation. So when you look at them, this is from the mirror, which is the reanalysis data set, the mean is conserved. But when you're looking at the forecast net output, the, you know, you're losing the mass with next forecast hours which is not correct, right? Because you should, this is a fundamental law, conservation of mass, and that should be conserved in the model phase. So to look at this, we also came up and then we, we tried to design a newer architecture, which is, uh, we'll be releasing soon, uh, approximately 15th to 20th of September, where we design an architecture based on encoder decoder. So you have the surface uh, variables, you have the vertical data, surface climate variables as well, and the vertical climate variables. And then you have the static inputs like channels, latitude, longitude, right? And then you provide the context time and the lead time. You provide all of these models, you perform the tokenization, you do the masking as we saw before, and you have the encoder, which the 225 to 50,000 tokens, you have the encoder and decoder with let's say 300 million parameter, 400 million parameter of encoder, 200 million of decoder, or you can see a smaller model with 200 million and 100 million, and you provide the output you do the unmasking output of the model and combine this. So what you do here, uh, what we've got here is a key feature of the model is that this model is grid-free model, so which can work for both Euclidean and spherical topologies. Encoder and decoder are completely attention-based, and ex all the different auxiliary information, like lead time and everything, are you know injected by the context tokens. 
and then there are no hard coded token or windows sites at least that we have seen in other uh, state of the art architecture like swin and other stuff where you have the hard coded you know token and uh, window sizes so input data we are providing two input time steps to the model and then we are you are we are just stacking all the vertical and temporal parameters and what is the pre text task of the model to generate so we do the model of masking, which is let's say 20% of the masking of the data and ask to generate the 20% of this. And also we provide the model a lead time. So let's say lead time can be return me 12 hours from now. What would be the atmosphere or the states will look like or you know, 18 hours from now and nearly 24 hours from now. So these are the lead times. So the model is learning over two things, which is unmasking. Uh, so masking and then learning the mask areas and also the lead time, which is a forecasting. So this is a couple of initial results that you're looking from the model when we were training the model, then the final outcomes. But when you're training the model, you're looking at this 20% masking model trying to predict three hours ahead. Then they have the different temperature T2M, which is three hours ahead, and then absolute error out of them. So you have the, here, you have the 200 million encoder, 100 million decoder, you have the calamity based loss, and then you, it runs for 10,000 gradient steps. Similarly, you look for another variable here, which is at 68, same approach, you're looking at absolute error. So model seems to doing, you know, way finer because it is able to predict and the mean absolute error, your absolute error is much lower compared to, uh, you know, not producing garbage anymore, right? So this is something, and then we went with something fun, which is what happens if I mask 99% of the data? Will the model be able to predict something? So let's say T68, we masked 99% of the data and asked the model to predict at the time step zero, fill up everything. And the model was able to do that. And we find out that this is the squared error. There is some amplitude here, but this was just for done for looking at the capability of model to even you know complete this information. So you have some uh, higher error in this case of the uh, you know amplitudes, but the model was able to complete that masking. So this gives us a good uh, motivation that okay, pro approaches like assimilation and other stuff can also be done through the model. So when we trained this model, we had the, you know, looking at the different downstream tasks and validating that, that this model is able to learn and you're able to get the information out of this. We tried to look at different forecasts, hurricane prediction and gravity wave parameterization. Parameterization is for the climate models and trying to see the model can be used or not. So one thing we look at the climate model downscaling. So we try to do the downscaling of the climate model data where we use the Euro cortex data, we coarse grain by 12 times. This is the evaluation that you're looking at. So based on input, AI model output, and then the ground truth. The model almost, you know, get the uh, perfect output from the model. Uh, similarly, you're looking at the spatial RMC, uh, which is approximately 0 0.5768 in the case of temperature. This is the input, this is the AI model, and this is the ground truth. So you're able to, you know, get a higher resolution data as well. Another one, which is a parameterization task. So here we provided the model with something the model has never seen before, which is, let's say, the model has seen UV, which was the U and V vector of the wind, but across 14 pressure levels only. So here we provided the U and V across 122 pressure levels, along with theta, which is derived by temperature and pressure, which is also across the uh, 122 pressure levels. So the model was given an input of, you know, 122 cross 488, uh, sorry, four cross 488, which is stacked all together. And then we are asking the model to predict the gravity wave parameterization, which is U prime and omega prime and V prime and omega prime. So what you're looking here is the model predictions, which is as close to as the ground truth, which an RMSC of 0 0.08. This is the hurricane forecasting of the model. So for the uh, LoRa and the ground truth predictions, we are looking at those. So if you're looking at the LoRa ground truth and LoRa prediction, the model is able to predict. There are some lags here, but the model is able to predict the hurricane for the next you know, 24 hours to 36 hours as well. And this is with a zero shot. The model was not fine-tuned for any of these approaches. So we just provided the model with the initial condition and the model forecasted all of those without, without any fine-tuning or any you know, further training. We also published a couple of papers that we published initially we presented in a scope paper, which is an archive, which you can, guys can check out. Then there's papers that we wrote for the ICLR, which also you can there. And then recent paper on ICML for the uh, gravity wave you know, propagation, which was for the uh, workshop spotlight talk. A couple of references for the folks to look at. And these are for the partners we've collaborated with, like UH, uh, Impact, NASA, IBM, ORNL, along with a couple more from Clark University in the case of GeoFM, 
and then Stanford in the case of the gravity wave parameterization uh, as well. Thank you. I'm open to any questions. Suju, that was fantastic. Thank you so much. Yeah, let's just open up the questions for everyone on the line. As people are raising their hand, I just want to say also, uh, a real treat to get two foundational model talks in in less than an hour. Like, uh, not I just want to call out like the amount of work for one foundational model is kind of unbelievable, but two in one presentation. I just wanted to say that it's kind of kind of crazy. Um, so I just hope folks, I didn't do it too fast. No, I think I mean we've had a uh, as you can tell from the last few. Um, uh, talks we've had kind of like a more research or more interest in foundational models as of late. So hopefully this is what everyone's appetite of two really exciting ones. And I know there's, as you mentioned, for the Weather FM, there's another version and there's a Prithvi version happening, a yes. versioning of that. So it's really exciting because people can get their hands on the Prithvi data and the Weather FM right now. Like you can get on, you can use these models. So yes, definitely. Yeah. So these models are open source on Hugging Face and uh, stuff. So people can, you know, take these models and uh, run run this by themselves. It would be better to actually drop that as well. So let me actually update that in my slide so folks can, once you distribute the slide, they can actually get this as well. Yeah, and I'll, I'll send out those paper links as well because we've, uh, we've linked those in the notes in the past as those have been coming out, but I'll refresh people's memory on um, the different versions as well. Oh, okay. uh, so yeah, any questions out on the line? I have I have a few um, as to get the conversation rolling. Um, so you talked about this this uh, this issue with the the mass for the weather FM model and this version that's coming out in September, and really sort of seeing this drop off in prediction at T sixty, and like my experience with like. Uh, NWP is like, there is like a theoretical limit in some sense, like you can continue modeling, but, you know, past 60 hours, there's also sort of, you know, what's the, what's the skill of that? So I'm really interested, and maybe this is an open-ended question, really interested to see what the outcome is, is going to be, because that is like sort of ground shifting. Uh, I mean, to be honest, be able to do that. Um, and my question in here after that comment is, about the spatial scale. So you showed one slide um, where you, you I think you did the prediction from to, to like 12.5 kilometers. Oh yeah. Yeah, right there, yes, 150 to 12.5. So um, have you explored even finer resolution? Um, and I'm personally, uh, I know I've talked to you in the hallway about this, but we have the high watt system, which is running at a much higher resolution to uh, four kilometers. And it's got a lot of application. And this is really exciting because a it doesn't necessarily doesn't need these daily huge computer runs. And it can potentially get at this high resolution. So is there a is there an idea to go even further past this 12.5 to something even higher resolution? Yes, uh, both are good questions. I'll answer one of them at one time. So here, what you looked at for the 60th time step was initially would be tested that the model can learn or approximate partial differential equation or not. So here, if you're looking at just three variables interaction, right? So you're looking at UV and surface pressure. So when we are right now with the foundation model, we are trying to do the forecasting, which is for nearly 10 days, or 12 days. So that will be upcoming. We are still fine tuning towards that. We will release when we release the model out as well. And obviously, when you're looking at the downscaling, so this is one of the initial tests that we did with the model version, and then we are trying to release uh, that, uh, you know, this downscaling. But yeah, the objective is to go as finer as possible, where I was thinking of releasing it, uh, you know, trying to test it out, even to create an HRR sort of situation where you have three kilometer resolution data. Yeah, I think the, the application of something like that is going to be huge, because people really sort of need that in the short term weather prediction space. And that higher resolution is is really sort of a game game changer. Because I was writing down, you know, sort of sort of scribbling different spatial questions, and I saw it on this slide. I was like, I think there's a lot of demand yeah. for that. Any other questions on the line? 
I had, I had a couple about Prithvi itself too. Yeah, I think Robert is there as well. Yeah. Oh, Robert, so just, go ahead. Is a, a fed up with all my questions, but I'll <laughs> just to follow <laughs> up on, on on that. I just can you, Sujit, can you explain to me sort of conceptually what, like how you picture the downscaling actually functioning because you know it would seem to me not being a weather person that the um the you know the 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 things that cause spatial variation at a finer scale uh maybe are are either maybe it's the same it's obviously it's the same physical laws but maybe they're different at a finer resolution or you don't have the 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 input data that actually is necessary to make those so as you're scaling down, how is like is is the model can't see something that isn't there? So like how how is it how how do we conceptualize that downscaling process? That's a very good question. Okay, so I'll go into a bit of a theory here. So one thing is what we know and what we don't know, right? So for example, what model is doing there is we are trying to explore that as well from the experimental point of view, what model is trying to learn. But what actually might be happening at a lower downscale resolution when the model is trying to do that? So firstly, there are a couple of changes that is happening. One, the model starts to learn. There are parts, if the model, one question is, if your model actually truly understand physics, which is, let's say the model understand Navier stroke equations or shallow water equations, then you give the model any resolution. It should be resolution invariant because fundamentally you have to solve for the same equation, right? So you don't need to worry about which resolution the model is going with. So when you do the Navier stroke or shallow water equation at, let's say, in the terms of, let's say, an image grid space where we have 600 by 128, we can take the same model. You can give it 128 by 256 and model will produce the next state with same precision, right? Because the model truly understands how the pixels now evaluate, uh, you know, you know, forecast in those situations. Now, the problem here with the weather forecasting situation where you're trying to downscale when you have the same partial differential equation and same system of equation govern, govern same system same governing system of equations then it becomes easier to translate but when you try to go from let's say mirror to error and error to hrr now we are not only moving from global to regional but also you are changing the way of how these data were assimilated right because they are all reanalysis data sets Fundamental equations remain the same, where the Navier Stokes and you know Navier Stokes Maxwell laws and other stuff will fundamentally remain the same, but the cost function that the ERA is using compared to MIRA and ERA, you know HRR is completely different. So now the model not only needs to understand the equation, but the transfer of the domain as well. So for example, in HRR, it becomes a closed bound solution, right? Because it's just happening over the US conversation. So then you uh, approximating all of these errors becomes much difficult in the model. So if I go from Mira to Mira downscale only, it becomes easier. It is comparatively easier than converting from Mira to error and error to HRR. But yeah, we have to see in the coming days how they will behave when you tr tr try to do the transfer from Mira to HRR or something like that. But fundamentally what you're trying to do is you're trying to learn a function mapping of FX to an A of FX where A is changing according to the different spatial constraint of the model. That's why you will fine tune actually it's towards the HRR or something so the model understand that it's, if I break down this one pixel into three by three pixel, then how this should be segregated. Okay, thank, thanks. I think I get that, yeah. Um, okay, I did have another question, but I'll, I'll let other folks go. Mm -hmm. Over yeah. to people. Yeah, uh, thanks, Sujit. Sujit, very uh, interesting presentation. Maybe a very naive question, but when you talk about all these physics-informed neural network, like at at I understand how you impl probably implement that uh, for smaller architecture, right? But for a foundational model where you have to think about downstream application as well as you know you have vast stream of data coming in, how do you actually constrain your model to learn that physics like are you using formatting your data so you have input and output in right format or are you using some sort of a loss function uh yeah could you maybe elaborate a little bit yeah. on that good question uh so when we compare it to the physics informed neural networks so in physics informed neural network you try to generally 
bound the equation or the learning optimization through the physics-based laws, right? Or you optimize, you generate a loss which follows certain, you know, physics-based principles or equations, and then you minimize based on that. But when we are designing this foundation model, so we, our loss is not taken into account by the physics. And we are not, you know, uh, a very naive way would have been probably to let's take, I take the fundamental seven equations. How does the change in velocity happens? It is related to gravity and other stuff of the wind, U vector, V vector, and you know pressure. Then you implement the conservation of mass as well as the loss function. You can, you know, you you perform the PV is equal to NRTS equation as well. So these, but there are so many equations. So you one you can compress all of them into one single loss function and let the model optimize for that. But here we are not doing any of that. So we are here. What we are trying to do is you're feeding the. So you are trying to learn the physics from the data. So you're you're not providing any specific equation to the model, rather than what you're telling the model, that you look at these different representation in the temporal space and learn the physics from that. And then we further evaluate those physics from those part, you know, that the model is able to understand the radiative transfer or the model is able to understand the generation and other stuff. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. So are you also feeding in some extra features that would help the model to learn no. those physics? No, okay. So, for example, very simple, when you try to look at the shallow water equation, the model only saw U, V, and pressure, nothing else. Gotcha. Okay. The model learned the mapping of a one pixel space to another pixel space, and then you can, if, if the model understands that mapping, how it's going up, then you can actually fundamentally take that specific pixel and you can map for any time step, right? Okay. Because, for example, if you know that if one pixel is going from T0 to T10, looks like this specific signature, then I can take that T from the, you know, that same pixel from T10 to T40 as well, or T60 as well. Okay, and in 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 that case, uh, maybe last follow up question on that: How does the model account for maybe some extreme events that it wouldn't see very often uh, in in those cases? Right, that's actually that that, that is something that we have been thinking on. Uh, for example, extreme events, let's say like hurricane or something like that, right? That changed right. it. So when we are generating these results, we have seen in all of these forecasting models something. The model can predict the path because the hurricane and the stuff are happening because of the other changes in atmosphere as well. Because if you look at it, your atmosphere remains same as the global atmosphere, which is the Earth, right? But uh, you, so your pressure and temperature are changing across, you know, sea level pressure is changing across a hurricane. So the model can actually predict where the hurricane is, or what project is going to follow. But the model actually come, is not able to predict very accurately what the intensity is. So you, you have a, you know, the gap in the intensity but you can get the trajectory from those surfaces. So we are trying to take care of that by fine tuning for a specific case as well. I see. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. But generally when you, yeah, but generally when you pre-train the model, you try to make the model, you know, learn sparse data and also trying to get it, like you understand the relationship between the different data types, not very hard. You're not trying to overfit the data on certain situation or a generalization happening, but you're trying to model to understand the relationship that's out there so that model can generalize on the multiple tasks that you choose in your time stream. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that makes sense. Thanks, Susie. Thanks. Any other questions on the line? Well, I had one more just around the Prithvi. So you had an example of uh, in this really nice workflow of like a, I think it was like a, a blue figure, a green figure, a red figure of these different uh, predictions. So you had like yeah. binary and uh, multi class. Do you have examples within this first version of Prithvi, that's this all we're talking about, not necessarily Prithvi V2, but of regression tasks? Because I think a lot of folks maybe on the line are, this is one of the challenges or one of the areas that they're maybe using deep learning and exploring foundational work. Um, so do you, have you um, explored that as, you know, some of the problems that you've been addressing? Yeah, so fundamentally, if you try to look at it, when you're looking at the burn scar classification, right? So here you're doing it for dealing with classes. So this can be converted to a regression problem as well. Uh, we will be, I'm like, uh, we will be releasing those downstream as well, where you can just plug in Prithvi and you can perform it for the regression task. Right now we're trying to, let's say, deal with not only burn scar, but trying to see the intensity. So that can be a regression task, right? So uh, there are different approaches, uh, you know, that one can take, but it's not very uh, difficult to convert from this part to regression. It just becomes of the, instead of one class, you try to predict our values. Mm, yeah, because you brought up, 
you brought up the idea of intensity. I feel like that's the secondary question that comes after you. Once you identify it, like how intense is that burn? How into like the, the secondary third questions that come out of it. And then yeah. it got me thinking as you're uh, showing this of like the different data streams that you would bring in. Um, you know, I'm thinking of like LIDAR data and, you know, things that are inherently have a continuous uh, yeah. data source uh, and then using that as a regression as well. So it's very interesting. Yeah, so I think for using other form of data set like LIDAR or something, it would be very difficult right now. We, I'm like, right now we have not tested with the modality change uh, in the data set. So we are primarily look at the HLS, which is Landsat and Sentinel, you can, the model is performing well. Uh, in our, so what we, what we are going to release one for three global version, which is by the end of August which is trained on the global data and not only the U.S. Cornish region. Uh, post that, we are going to release on the multi-resolution. There we can play around with LiDAR and stuff and see if the model is able to understand all of those things. Yeah, I'm really excited for that. This is, uh, I think, such cool innovation um, that you guys are doing over at Impact. And uh, I, I hope that um, we get to have you as a reoccurring guest <laughs> to present all the cool things that you're doing over there. Um, yeah. But we won't eat up all of your time, but I think uh, what you guys are doing over there is really fantastic. So uh, you've got a, uh, an interested audience here for sure. Yeah, no, definitely. I think I'll come up next year with an update on all of these models. So version one, <laughs> 1. 1.2, something like that. That's the way to do it, right? <laughs> yeah. So any other thoughts on the line? I know as we're just sort of closing up, I'll leave one more space for questions if anyone has them. All right, healthy pause. Okay, thanks again, Sujit, and um, we'll stay in contact, and uh, uh, I'll share out a, an update with some of those papers that you had mentioned as well um, in your slides. And as more things uh, come out, as you had mentioned, you know, we, as I plugged before, we will be really interested of, of these secondary, third applications of, of these versions. So um, hope to have you on. Wonderful. Yeah, and uh, see everyone on the line in, in two weeks. Perfect. See you. Bye. Thank you, guys. Thanks, guys. Bye, everyone. Bye.